Welcome to the Table Talk podcast brought to you by Food Matters and this week in partnership with Loughborough University. Now in these podcasts we explore a huge range of crucial issues and exciting developments in the food industry with brilliant guests drawn from all areas of expertise. I'm Stephen Gates, I'm a TV presenter and writer specialising in food and science. Now the title of this podcast is Cooking with Electricity. Now I know that might sound like a 1960s government information project, but hang on right there, because this is actually pretty futuristic, fascinating, world-changing stuff. We're going to be tackling deforestation, the downsides of cooking with biomass, cooking in the developing world, cutting deaths from household air pollution, and calling out for partners to join in an extraordinary project. Now, I'm joined by a panel of guests from Loughborough University. We have Ed Brown, Modern Energy Cooking Services Research Director. Hello. Nick Russo, International Liaison Manager. Hello. Simon Batchelor, UK Research and Innovation Coordinator. Hi. And Ahn Tran, International Liaison Manager. G'day. Now, um, we're going to discuss the, the programme, which it's the MECS, Modern Energy Cooking Services. Um, and the idea is it could help save 4 million lives a year across the developing world by changing how people cook. Simon Batchelor, now, I understand you were the originator of the programme. What is it and what is the problem that you're setting out to solve? So it's pretty remarkable in this day and age when we can, we're considering going to Mars and we're, we're going back to the moon and everything, that actually three billion people on the planet still cook with wood and charcoal uh, for their main cooking needs. And as you said in your introduction, uh, that actually causes respiratory problems, non-communicable diseases, problems with the heart, uh, such that four million lives a year are cut short I mean, put that in the context of COVID, uh, we're, we're recording this at, in late June. We've just passed the mark where 500,000 people have died. Actually, every year for the last X years, I don't know how many, 4 million people have had their lives cut short from this basically an extreme public health problem. And that's breathing in the smoke from, and emissions from the charcoal and wood that they're using. So I, I've filmed in uh, refugee camps in Uganda, for instance. I think people don't really understand, but, but people have a hut and they will, they will cook inside it. And, and if you're inside that hut while, whilst cooking, it's a very cultural thing as well. But when, when, when you're cooking inside it, it is horrible. You know, I, I couldn't stay in there. The, the people, the, these amazing women who cook in the huts are, are a lot more used to it. But it's a real, it's, it's a sort of hidden problem in a way, isn't it? That, that millions of people die every year from something as basic as cooking inside. Yes. And I mean, your image of a hut is correct. In fact, there are a few windows and the hut is probably got a corrugated sheet roof. So it's it's getting hot, it's getting hot. It's just a ridiculously bad situation given where we are in the 21st century. And yet that is almost half the world is experiencing that. Um, and yes. so- And we just don't really realize that, do we? No, we don't. So there has been action. Over the last 40 years, people have tried to solve that problem by improving the combustion of the charcoal and the wood. Um, and so we get what are called improved cookstoves. But actually, recent research over the last 10 years has shown that those uh, cookstoves barely improve the situation. They do use very slightly less wood, they're less charcoal. But again, going back to your image, Stefan, the, um, you know, it, the woman is still there in that room, in all that smoke, still, <clears throat> excuse me, still um, cooking in, in a ridiculous situation. So there were beginnings of calls for something alternative. What was the alternative approach? All the predictions were that actually these rollout of these improved cook stoves wasn't even keeping up with population growth. And so we would reach 2030 and still have over 3 billion people cooking in this way. The uh, thing that modern energy cooking services um, brought to the table was that there was this weird phenomena in the development world that cooking was spoken of in this room and electrification was spoken of in a completely different room. So actually the progress on electrification over the last 10 years, 20 years has been quite significant. So if we look at Asia, we got 65% in 2000 were connected to electricity. Now, it's 94%, it's nearly, it's nearly there. 
And yet, 1.7 billion people live in Asia still cooking with biomass. Mm -hmm. So we, we asked ourselves the question, is it possible now to cook with electricity? Is it, is it cost effective? Is it affordable? Um, how do the renewable energies influence that? And, and so, so basically, this is a, ho a whole new approach looking at this because of the advances of, of, of elect electrification. And, and that shifts the, 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 the focus, really, on, on, on improved cook stoves was, was one, one of the solutions. But now you're thinking of a whole new approach. Is that right? Yes. I mean, your example was the extreme situation. Refugee camp in, you, in the back end of Uganda somewhere. Uh, actually, there are a lot of people, urbanization is a, is a thing, and cities are, in Africa are predicted to double in the next uh, 10 years. So there's a lot of people living in apartments, in small houses um, that have connections to electricity, but don't cook with electricity. So we here in the UK, we're used to cooking with electricity, and, and you know some of the Scandinavian countries only cook with electricity we have our natural gas so we balance between it and i suspect many of the listeners to this podcast are professional chefs and they're all going to go oh yeah but you don't get the controlling aspect of 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 uh, gas with electricity well you can't control charcoal and wood you light the fire and then off it goes we've all done our barbecues we all know how difficult it is to control and so that that step into the world of controllable electric cooking is an amazing step for people. And we've now found these energy efficient appliances. We have found electric pressure cookers, the instant pot, I, well, I probably shouldn't say too many brand names, but instant pot <laughs> are one of the leaders. Um, and those, those can cook long, heavy foods, which is what a lot of Africans eat uh, in about one fifth of the energy that an electric hot plate would, would take. And the cost is about one fifth of what people in urban situations are paying for their charcoal and wood. Uh, do, do you think it's a sort of, uh, it's a slightly patronizing approach for us to, to think that a, a lot of countries around the world don't have access to electricity? Do, do, do we need to change our mindset about the availability of different um, uh, power sources? It, it's changing quickly. So, uh, you know, there, there are still 800 million people that do not have access to electricity. And often access to electricity is in a lower tier. They get, they get lower quality and they can't immediately switch to cooking. But if we're looking to the future 10 years, you know, the renewable energy is becoming much, much cheaper. This whole thing started because we, we saw the price of PV panels coming down and most importantly, we saw the price of energy storage coming down. All this Tesla stuff with batteries, all the electric cars, that is reducing the price of batteries. And batteries actually overcome many of the shortfalls of weak grid electricity and weak electricity. So, so, so if, we, if we go a little bit further with this, um, I gather the UK government's provided funding for Modern Energy Cooking Services Programme. Um, and can you, can you take up the story now and explain a little bit more about it and how it unfolds? Yeah, absolutely, yes. Um, so yeah, um, so the Department for International Development, as is at the moment, obviously uh, undergoing a merger at the moment with the mm -hmm. Commonwealth Office, but um, yeah, our understanding is that uh, we're, we're now two years into a five-year programme, um, and um, uh, we're doing this uh, very large programme supported by the UK government alongside the World Bank. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a global program really obviously focusing on those parts of the world where the issues that Simon's just described uh, are, are most intense so that's in uh, South Asia and in large parts of, of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and I suppose the best way of describing what we're doing is we, we have five different kind of strands of work that we're that we're doing that add up to this uh, attempt to completely rethink the way in which we're, we're, we're approaching this. So um, we've talked a lot about electric cooking. We're, we're, we are also interested in, in other ways in which we can address the, um, the, the limitations of the current ways of, of doing things. So modern energy cooking services is trying to rethink this way that's been dominant about thinking about how we address this issue for about the last 20 or 30 years. So the five areas we're focusing on are, one is 
Um, simply, what do we currently know? Why do we think we can't cook with electricity? Uh, why do we think that LPG is not a, an appropriate fuel in, in, in certain markets and so on? So we're working really closely with a whole range of different partners to evaluate exactly where we are in terms of our understanding of markets and prices and, and all of the kind of factors affecting the transition. So we have a big study coming out within the next uh, week or so, which is the first real detailed study of the, the market for electric cooking, for example. So then we have a second area, which is about technology and, um, and technology and innovation. So into that area, it's working with universities and other partners and innovators around, for example, uh, we know that there are electric pressure cookers available um, and that they are currently utilized a lot in Europe and the US, not so much in other parts of the world. Number one is, are they suitable for using not only on an AC uh, uh, national grid, but also off grid? Um, and the answer to that question at the moment is there aren't very many of them. And they're, they're the ones that are out there are maybe not amongst the best. So one of the things we're looking to innovate on is how can we develop a, uh, a more effective DC version of the electric pressure cooker that then solar home systems, mini grid companies and so on can, can, can utilize. Um, and then very quickly, the other three, three, three areas are um, data and how we measure the success that we're, or, or otherwise that we're, that we're having and how we can connect what we're doing in this area into the broader intentions of the international community in terms of meeting the sustainable development goals. Uh, secondly is how do we find the finance to achieve the, the, the scale up that we're talking about in these in these kinds of areas and then thirdly how do we accelerate international commitment to these issues so during a time at the moment in relation to, to covid we noticed that there's a lot of talk about electrifying health centers and so on and so forth as you might imagine but actually there's a was a very strong connection into the whole kind of a, a, a question about comorbidity from different diseases and COVID seems to, to affect people worse than their pre-existing lung conditions. Also, is COVID going to affect uh, people in the future because they've become weakened due to this, but also simply that the, what are the impacts of a four or five year recession going to be? We know what that's going to be like here. We have a, an assumption of what it's going to be like here. You can imagine a country where there's no social security or very little social security, then what are the implications there? So, so it's, it's, a, it's a very broad program. It ranges from uh, knowledge and, uh, and understanding kind of where, where we are, right the way through new forms of technology, new business models, uh, new ways of understanding how people cook, right the way through to issues to do with finance, to do with government commitment uh, and policy making and all those kinds of things. So, it's, I mean, what's interesting is it's not just a, a, a dream that you have of, of doing something fantastic, but, but there are, there are compartmentalised achievements along the way. Can you expand a little bit on that? I mean, how do you, how do you roll this out? It's that, I mean, that's a brilliant question. It, it, it's, it, it's that, so there is some work that has to go on at the global level with the major institutions saying, look, you need to think about this issue. You need to look at how we are channeling resources into how we deal with this and what things you are supporting. At the same level, we also need to be working with individual companies. So that could be a mini grid operator in Kenya um, who uh, currently, uh, is selling uh, electricity to the consumers on, on their grid, and maybe they're using it for a little bit of television, uh, radio, lighting, and so on. Um, and they're actually not being able to sell as much electricity through that grid as they were originally hoping. So and are, are, there, are there lots of these little mini grids? It's the first time I've come across the, the term uh, yeah, no, mini, absolutely. mini grid. Yeah, Can so, you paint so, the picture of it a little bit more? Yeah, no, absolutely. So in, country, uh, uh, in countries across Africa, um, the level of, of access to electricity may be as low as 20 or 30 percent, even lower than that in some cases. And in order to bring electricity into those communities, especially where they are miles away from large urban centres, then mini grids are often presented as the, the most cost effective way of, of doing that rather than extending a national grid. I mean, there's a whole other set of debates about 
are we actually better off going down that route in terms of distributed generation here in the West? But in terms, this is happening now. So one of the programs we're working on is in Nigeria, where the World Bank is investing in a significant program of expansion of mini grids. So one of the things we're looking at there is not only about those mini grids uh, providing access to mobile phone charging, lighting, uh, that, kind, that kind of thing, but also actually where people are paying for their, their, their fuels. And that's important because this is, we're not talking about a giveaway. We're talking about building markets that actually create a long-term sustainable future. So in those places where there is a, a, a market, because people are already buying fuel, they're not just going and chopping trees down if you see what I mean. Mm. Then in those, in, in those circumstances, if we can show that, that there is a price equivalence, then actually not only is that beneficial for people's living conditions and cooking conditions, but it's also beneficial for the companies trying to develop those business models of the mini grids and, and so on. And I think it's quite quite important to explain this to people really well, isn't it? Because I, th there is a perception that you, if you want to do good, go and give something to people. That, that, that'll sort problems out. But of course, the moment you drop a bag of food or, or uh, some infrastructure for free, you kind of ruin local markets. You know, the, the value of, of, of things locally suddenly either disappears or, or it, it imbalances things. And there's a real danger in that old fashioned approach of emergency relief, of, of just giving uh, stuff. And, Whereas yeah. really what you want to do is in, in, integrate that into the local economy. Absolutely, and, and all of us, I think on this call, have been working in international development for, for many years, and we've seen that. So like one of the things that we've observed over the years with the Clean Cookstoves program, not so much recently because I think they've learned the, the, the lessons of this, but for a long time, you would go and visit a Clean Cookstoves project. Uh, you'd see the people saying, it was sort of, you'd go into their house and say, look, this is our wonderful new cookstove. Isn't it fantastic? They gave it to us over there, aren't they nice people? You go back six months later, where's your cookstove? Oh, it's in the garden over there. We're, yeah. we're, we're using it as a, as a flower arrangement, you know, or, or, whatever, or whatever it might be. Yeah. because it wasn't valued in that sense and it didn't necessarily bring them an economic benefit um, it was only something that was there because it had been designed and produced by, by, by someone from outside mm -hmm. so what we're really trying to do is, is, is make sure that what we're producing is something that people will use that's something that people will want to purchase and will value for a whole host of different reasons and I think the really exciting thing about cooking with electricity is not only does it have health implications and improvements, not only does it uh, address uh, carbon and, and, and uh, stopping people from cutting down forests and so on, but also it's, one is it's clean. So and I don't mean that in a health sense. I mean, in the sense of, you know, for example, with a, a, an electric uh, um, a pressure cooker, you're gonna make a, 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 a bean dish that, make, that, that can save you time. So you can cook in this, this, this bean dish in about half the time it would take you to cook it on charcoal. But also, once you know how to utilize it, you put the, 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 the beans, the, the ingredients in, you maybe do a little bit of frying to begin with to give it a little bit of extra flavor. And then you put the top on and you press the button. And you walk away and you can A, not be smelling of smoke if you need to go out to a meeting afterwards, you don't need to go and get changed, but also, you know, you, you can leave it. It's not going to, to, to um, uh, a stick onto the bottom because that's one of the massive advantages of a, of a pressure, pressurized and in particular non-stick con container. You can go off and do something else. You can be f uh, sure that the kids are not going to be in danger because there's an open fire or whatever reason. So it's a whole host of different issues together that bring these different benefits. And actually, it's something that's quite aspirational in the way that an improved cook stove, it's slightly better. It's got, you know, you can use slightly less fuel, you save a bit of money, which is great, fantastic. But with this pressure cooker, then not only are you saving money, but also it's, it's clean. It's, 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 uh, it, it's, um, it allows you to go and do other things, you know, and so on. Mm. So it's, it's, um, that's the complexity of this issue. Cooking is, is an issue that has got so many cultural, health, environmental implications to it. That, but we treat it as something that's very, very simple.
Mm. And uh, I mean, the, 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 the problems fall sort of disproportionately on the shoulders of women, I think, as well. But we'll come on to that in a little while. Now, how are you supporting innovation within the programme? Um, a whole variety of different ways. Um, so uh, we have now run, I think it's, it's four different types of challenge fund activity. So with two of them, we've run ourselves and we've called these kind of these are MEX challenge fund activities. We had, I think, in a first round that we called MEX TRID. Uh, <laughs> but we had around, um, I think it was 18 uh, companies or grassroots organisations that we supported small scale projects on. So these were, I think, up, they were only 30,000 each, weren't they? These, 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 these projects. And this was where there was an idea. So it might be an idea that, that a very innovative idea, for example, phase change materials. So in other words, could you actually heat uh, these materials uh, directly from the sun and then use that uh, heat later on? So at the moment, you know, sort of solar cooking is another kind of part of all this, but had a really bad rap over the years because you have to use it outside in the sun has particular implications. Mm. Other uh, types of materials that, absorb heat and then can you can utilize that heat for cooking at other, at other times it's relatively new technology but we supported an industry to look at that we had another one where we looked at uh, the different types of batteries that you might use for uh, um, cooking and whether there was a, like something we could do in terms of second life of, 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 um, of lithium-ion batteries that could reduce the cost for this kind of purpose. Uh, new types of approaches to the distribution of LPG, uh, new types of approaches towards pay-as-you-go LPG, uh, market testing of new electric pressure cookers in different circumstances. So lots of different um, attempts to, to uh, uh, slightly change a, a business model, to develop the next type of technology and so on. So that, that's the kind of what we were doing there. We just have a new round of those that we're just contracting. I think there are 13 of them in nine different countries. And these are all to do specifically with electric pressure cookers and particularly to do with uh, market testing. They're slightly larger, longer projects. So I think they're about 60,000 each to each company. Um, and there they're trialing, for example, on mini grids, they're trialing say 100 pressure cookers with customers, taking uh, um, the, the stories of the people that are using them in their homes, cooking different meals, what are they cooking, how are they cooking, how, how are they finding it, and then using that information to further improve the business model of both the manufacturer of that device and also the mini grid operator in terms of their bottom line from that. Mm -hmm. So those are quite, those are, are, are quite small targeted projects. On the other hand, we also are working with uh, a number of, of, of on another program which has got slightly bigger programs so there it's kind of like a more wholesale development with a particular developer but how do we develop your strategy for example we have one company in Kenya that's producing their own uh, pressure cooker specifically targeted for the Kenyan market um, so it's it's a, it's being designed in a, in, a, in a way that so it's entirely produced and manufactured in, in Kenya um, and um, also rather than if you buy one from from china then most of the symbols on it relate to how you cook meals in china or particularly in the west um whereas this one all of them the the, the um the the, the knobs and, and and buttons and so on they all relate to uh particular uh, dishes in in east africa so it's yeah. that, that 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 kind of thing makes uh, a lot of sense doesn't it yeah now, let, let's move on to simon um you're, you're the uk research and innovation coordinator this program clearly involves a lot of research can you give us a flavor of some of the research that you've done uh yes so um ed keeps emphasizing these pressure cookers but the thing is uh this is about cooking real meals for real people and you don't mess with people's food it's got to taste right it's got to be culturally acceptable so one of the other um, mistakes that the clean cooking improved cook stove sector made was they they focused on how quickly can you boil water because they were trying to get the combustion efficiency of the charcoal and the wood improved they focused on the uh, on the boiling of the water side of things and didn't take into account how people eat when they eat um, 
you know, what are they actually doing? So a lot of our research is in things like cooking diaries. We find families that are currently cooking with uh, charcoal and wood. Um, we monitor them uh, we, with their permission, obviously, uh, <laughs> them for uh, two, three weeks, um, find out what their menu is, um, and, and what sequence they're cooking their, their meals. As Ed was saying, you fry your onions, then you add your meat, etc. Then we swap them out with, uh, say, an electric pressure cooker. But again, I don't want to emphasize that uh, too much. There are other energy efficient appliances emerging there. Um, but but I think it's really interesting for people to understand that the, the, the context of this is really important because the cultural aspect of how you, it seems obvious. Here's a better way of doing it. You, 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 won't, you won't be ill from, from smoke fumes. You just do it. Well, there's a vast cultural impact of, of changing these things. It doesn't taste things. right. If it I doesn't think taste quite right, get enough of that. So a lot then, of people then why we say, oh, but I like the smoky flavor. Or at least, actually, interestingly, a lot of Westerners like us will say, oh, but the Africans like their smoky flavor. Actually, so some of our research has been to do, I won't bore you with the techie, process but it's called discrete choice modeling where you can get honest answers from people and mm. when we get that honest answers across bigger populations actually smoky flavor is not the key issue and uh, actually people will say that it tastes okay even when it's cooked within uh, these modern appliances yeah and so, so things like the diary studies and things like that are really interesting. What, what did you discover from that? The, what else, other than um, things like uh, the taste and flavor, what about cost and, and um, you know, the actual sort of needs for energy storage and things like that? Yeah, so, so cost was a huge one. Um, we, we, we found that if you, if you cooked the same meal, so again, I'm not talking about boiling water, talking about cooking a meal, then the same meal within Nairobi um, actually charcoal, kerosene, uh, LPG gas, and electricity on a hot plate, so not an efficient device, they all come out much of a muchness, 30 to 35 Kenya shillings for that meal. But the electric pressure cooker as an energy efficient device, uh, that came out down at sort of the seven or eight shillings. So it's about one right. fifth of the cost that people are currently paying. And that's an important point that Ed made along the way, which is there is a current expenditure on fuels, particularly for the urban uh, uh, situation. And, and that expenditure can be converted into this cleaner, cleaner fuel. That is a gain for the utility, that is a gain for tax revenue for governments because suddenly instead of an informal charcoal sector that you can't tax, you're, you're suddenly, um, uh, you know, have it in one place. It, uh, there are so many gains and I just wanted to pick up on one gain that Ed skipped over, which is the, uh, the climate change. So black carbon are little particulates that are created when you burn wood and charcoal incompletely. And some scientists say that black carbon is the second most forceful thing in the whole of climate change. It's a short-lived uh, climate forcing agent. So it disappears relatively quickly, but we have 3 billion people producing new black carbon every day. Mm. Um, and so actually action on this could create a very quick response to climate change. And what about, what about the, the different aspects of this? So, so different solutions for, for different tools. I mean, uh, uh, in, in Uganda, we have a lot of ugali. It's a, it's a pretty simple dish. It's a, it's a really big pasty um, carb dish. But what about things like bread making and, and things like that, which, are, which is an enormous, enormously important food around the world? I mean, how do you cope with that with electricity? I mean, that's a long, long process that involves a huge amount of fuel. Can, can, can this sort of shift to electricity cope with that? So um, there are still some challenges, bread making, chapatis, uh, that sort of stuff. I mean, the, the electric pressure cooker companies are just beginning to introduce uh, air fryers, top loading that you put on your, so you could still in, conceive of a single device with two different lids and that lid mm -hmm. different cooking effects. But the important thing is, if I can just jump back to the cooking diaries, what we saw 
was that people didn't have to change their menu. Um, so what they were cooking could be cooked within these different devices. And um, it, you talked about, well, bread making can take a long time. Believe me, matoke in Uganda takes a huge amount of time. Um, so you're supposed to steam it for an hour. You wrap it in banana leaves, you steam it for an hour. You then take it out, you wrap it with new banana leaves, and then you boil stroke steam for another three to four hours. So I had the experience that I was in front of a whole group of policymakers and government and, and people in Uganda. I'd never cooked matoke before, but they had given me three students who knew how to cook matoke, but three pressure cookers. And they said, well, can you cook matoke in the pressure cooker? I said, I don't know. Right, let's give it a go. So <laughs> the students wrapped it up and put it in the pressure cooker. And I said, right, so what would you normally do? They said, we would steam it for an hour. Okay, I don't know, let's give it 20 minutes. So we gave it 20 minutes, unwrapped it. Oh man, that's right. Okay, let's wrap it up again, put it back in. Now what would you do? Oh, well now we would boil or steam it for three hours. All right, well, let's give it 50 minutes. You know, and when it came yeah. out, there were 70 people in the room. They were all polite. I don't know. They have reassured me several times after the event that they weren't just being polite, but they were all going, oh my goodness, this tastes proper. This yeah. is the right sort of food. So yeah, it, it can address local foods and local uh, tastes. And that's really important. Now, I understand that you're also looking at the, the scope for food to be pre-cooked before it gets to household. I mean, that's, again, it's another fundamental change. How, how does this work? So what we saw in the cooking diaries was that 25% of their meals are reheated. Um, so they're not afraid of leftovers and then reheating them the next day. And most of their food is being cooked from the raw. Um, so if we look at uh, Britain, the amount of energy we actually expend in the kitchen has reduced by half since 1970. And that's due mainly to three things. One is increasingly efficient devices so that your fan driven oven is more efficient than an oven without a fan. Um, it, but it's also an uptake of pre-cooked food. It's the TV dinners, it's the putting it in the microwave reheating type stuff. The third reason is somebody changed the statistics and took kettles and microwaves out of the kitchen, which is crazy. Um, but uh, so that that's the trend in developed economies, that actually the energy is applied to the food somewhere other than in your kitchen. And there's an opportunity for reducing what the burden on the family of, particularly when we're talking solar cells, driving a battery, and cooking meals, if we could actually shift half of that energy into a factory such that you bought, so this is a, a tin of pre-cooked mm. beans. So beans take forever to, to, to cook from raw, but uh, Canadian researchers have set up a factory and identified the 12 varieties uh, that can be pre-cooked and retain all their nutrition. They have stimulated farmers around the factory to actually produce the beans. And then they started uh, pre-cooking them and selling them in Nairobi. Mm. I can imagine many of your viewers are saying, yeah, but look, it's in a plastic tub. We don't want plastic packaging, but we'll tackle that one a little bit later. <laughs> but also this is a whole new potential for industry. Now in somewhere like Nigeria, where it's, it's highly entrepreneurial, um, things like this are, are an opportunity rather, rather than a problem, I guess, to be solved. Yes, and um, I mean, in fact, in, even in any of those cities, you get a lot of women selling what street food. Now actually street food is not always eaten on the street. Sometimes people come home from work, pick up the food and, and eat it at home. And so that's a real opportunity. And then you've got, you've got ideas like Uber Eats. I know, again, many of your listeners will, may not realize how many mobile phones Africans have. But they do have mobile phones and they could actually be, you know, uh, offering, I've got 10 portions of Ugali extra. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm 200 yards away. Do you want it? You know, and, and that's, so we're exploring trying to move the cooking sector in 
Africa and Asia, I come back to my 1.7 billion in Asia that have electricity, have phones, move them into the 21st century so that when we get to 2030, actually there are a lot less people that are killing themselves by cooking on wood and charcoal. Yeah, which is blooming good news. Now, um, Arne, you've been incredibly patient um, waiting for, <laughs> to get to you. Um, now, I understand the programme's not just focused on household cooking. So what else is there? What other scenarios are you looking at? Oh, look, there's so many different scenarios, and I'm really, really passionate about um, next strategy to look at uh, the aspiration of just leaving no one behind. Uh, we've got a stream that looks at displacement in humanitarian settings and also at institutional settings. So um, back in 2017, I was lucky enough to visit a refugee camp in Rwanda, and I got to speak to the refugees there. And when you, you speak to the men and women in these committees, and I ask the question, what do you prioritize um, when you think about energy? And all the men would say electricity. And then all the women said cooking. And so cooking is predominantly a burden placed on women and children in terms of collecting yeah. firewood and uh, being there all day cooking the meals for the families. And you know, what is cooking? Cooking is life. If you don't eat, you don't live. So it's really important that the next program uh, focuses on uh, these settings that uh, make sure that women and children aren't left behind. And so uh, it's really important that when we talk about household cooking, that we include those poorest of the poor that don't have access to cooking. Mm. And, and, the, and again, the burden falling on women is is extraordinary. And again, it's really hard to visualise until until you're there. In in India, we saw um, we saw the women going out for firewood. Now, you know, it, it sounds like the simplest thing. They'll no, we'll nip out and we'll just get some firewood. It's impossible. They they would be they would be out for about two hours collecting enough mm -hmm. firewood for the day, maybe a day and a half of, of cooking. Um, so they they're collecting the water. Uh, they're collecting the firewood. There are risks involved with going to get these things because you're out of the community. You're you're at risk for, for from you know whoever might be out there attack or or you know various different problems that can occur once you're out of your your safe zone. And it, it's really hard to visualise that that all of this burden seems to fall on women. Yeah, gender-based violence is a is a huge issue in kind of the displacement refugee setting, uh, considering that a lot of these. Uh, refugees do not have the rights to work, cannot leave the environment. And even though uh, the large international organization gives a small portion of firewood to cook per month, it's not enough. And so they have to forage. And considering that when they go out, it's illegal, they don't report these violences against them. And so it's a continual cycle of um, despondent people getting even worse and worse situations just because of their uh, where they are and uh, being forced out of their homes. Yeah. So um, India is a great example, Stefan, of this uh, potential of electrification. They claim that they have now electrified 98% of all villages in, in India. Now the claim uh, has some caveats to it. Uh, you can, the, the wire reaches the village and at least 10% have connected to that wire. So it doesn't mean that 98% of households are connected to electricity, yeah. but the potential is there. India is very ambitious, you know, to actually, and as long as it's uh, recognized as a cheaper expenditure for the family than actually going out and, and being accosted or going out and paying the fine because you're collecting illegally from a forest, you know, the, the, it's, it then becomes standard household economics as to whether people will take it up or not. Mm. And Arne, I, mean, I guess the, we're talking about, about quite complex infrastructure with, with electricity, but, but again, if you're going to invest in a, in a country, it, you know, it's a bit like don't buy people food, buy them, you know, give, give them the, the resources to build a road and then you give them the, the infrastructure within which they can actually actually work. And the same thing, I, I guess, goes for, elect for electricity. If you're building infrastructure, then there are untold other opportunities that, that you're creating from that. Definitely. So sustainability is a huge issue within uh, these displacement and institutional settings. So just imagine um, five football fields are cut down every day to feed uh, people in uh, Bangladesh, in the Rohingya's uh, refugee camps. And that's huge amount of uh, 
you know, deforestation that happens around there. And the influx of people came within months. And so there needs to be an alternative solution. So uh, people such as UNHCR are trialing LPGs in these camps. And while this is still an intermediate step change, which is extraordinarily uh, different from what they are, and it's been quite successful, it's still, they're still spending a million dollars per month to sustain this. So it's not a sustainable uh, long-term solution and electricity generated by new renewable energy in the place in the time is potentially a, a step change for yeah. these situations. Because, because cutting, cutting down, the, you know, it sounds like a simple thing, go and get some firewood. But what you're doing there is, is, is if you're, you're removing the biomass from there, you know, it's, it's like somebody having a mango tree and you, and you have a, a medical emergency, you've got to burn the mango tree for charcoal and sell that and that'll get you $50. Now, that's great because you've got a med medical emergency. Now you have no mango tree and, and, and it causes systemic problems that further down the line as well. Yeah, um, erosion, uh, you know, lack of, of infrastructure and just the actually the conflict with host communities is an issue within these displacement settings. So um, when we work with these com uh, refugee communities and displacement communities, we also work with host communities to make sure that there's uh, a sense of solidarity with them. And so uh, they're seen as a cooking solution for humanity and not just uh, the special few that gets international help. Yeah. Now, how about um, on, a, on a different scale? How, what about cooking in schools and things like that? I mean, obviously, you need a larger pot, but how does the, the concept of cooking change and, and can electricity still support all of that? Uh, I just want your viewers just to imagine a pot, not just any pot, a pot that's 1.5 meters across. <laughs> You can actually sit in this bathtub. <laughs> and feed yourself. That's how big these porridge pots are within these schools. And they feed hundreds of children per day. And so what this cooking is, is, is these heavy beans, as Simon mentioned before, uh, they normally cook beans or porridge or rice, really simple foods that don't need much, but it's, it's about heating the, the food and water. And I've been to these schools that you mentioned before, Stephen, and the, it's like putting your face in a campfire. And it's and these people work all day in that environment. Mm. Uh, it, it just needs to change. And the thing is, the technology is out there. It's just the political will, the economic will, to make a change. Yeah. Uh, there's innovation that needs to happen in terms of cooking, uh, like a pressure cooker in those large pots. You know, physics and a big explosive tin can. Which <laughs> not very sustainable. But I'm not going in the kitchen. No, I'm not going. <laughs> Somebody else go in and turn it off. We're well, looking at quite, innovation from businesses. And I think one of the one of the really interesting things about this whole area is when we first started thinking about these kinds of issues, then when people talk about clean cooking, they talk about the household. But then when you start thinking about so, you know, Simon talking about the amount of people that buy food from outside the house and that really you think, well, that's quite a proportion of the amount of cooking that goes on. But then if you think someone like Kenya. You think, what a young population is it? So, so maybe of those that are at school age, maybe that's, what do you think? That 30, 40% of the population is at, is at that kind of age. And then there is a requirement of all schools in Kenya to provide three meals a day to those students. So immediately, when you start thinking about how, to what degree are we addressing the need for clean cooking within, with, within each of these countries, then if we're not tackling the issues that Anne is leading on in this, in this program, then we're not tackling clean cooking. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something that as we kind of begun to reflect on what we were doing, that we realised that, you know, this is absolutely crucial. What Anne is doing is, is, is one of, if not the most central parts of the whole program because of those, those challenges. And no one or very, very few people are actually thinking about it in those terms. And, and what, what stage are you at with all of this? So we're at the initial stage where we're undertaking a landscape study, both within displacement settings and institutional cooking. And we hopefully, through that research, we'll be able to uh, develop a, an action plan to work with uh, large organisations such as the World Food Programme or the UNHCR to develop really innovative modern energy cooking. And we're not just looking at technology changes, we're looking at pilot political changes, we're looking at economic market-based approaches within these environments because um, one of the biggest things is funding. Uh, these organizations work on one-year funding cycles and if you think about one million dollars per month on LPG alone, if you can just accumulate that over a number of years, you can pay off a large solar home, uh, so 
solar system within the, the camps, within a school setting, and pay that off within five years. It, it's just economic sense. And it's not done because there's no political will to change a system that works on one year cycles. So we work on a whole range of levels, not just technology, but political, uh, legal, economic, social. It's, it's all, it's a very complex field. Yeah. But we're at risk to take the challenge. Okay, well, this brings us on to Nick. Nick Russo, you've, you've been even more patient than Arne has. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for hanging on for us. Um, so tell us all about the role of businesses. So, so there's some extraordinary challenges here. Who are you working with to address these? How is all this going to unfold? Sure, thank you. Um, well, I've been enjoying being in Mexico about a year now, and it's been so motivating for me personally. And I think we've, we've actually seen that motivation passing into some of these companies you're working with. So I'm, I guess the best example of that, Simon and I went to China um, back end of last year, um, while we were still able to do that, and we visited a large uh, EPC company, Medea. Um, and we talked to a group of engineers about the opportunities in Africa and our research. And one of them got immensely excited when he saw one of the photos of one of our cooking diary studies. And he said, that is the EPC that I designed. So he had a personal connection with it. Yeah. And he had never thought that he was doing something which could save lives. He thought he was just shipping product, you know, making something which people would like in the Western world. Yeah. And I think he has kept in touch with us and, and they are really excited that they can have this kind of beneficial impact. Um, so we're now talking to a whole bunch of other companies. So Instant Brands has been mentioned, Group Seb, Morphe Richards, Panasonic, Bosch. They're all really interested. They're all keen to get engaged. They need help with understanding how to do that because it's unfamiliar territory for many of them, as well as the, some of the very large Indian and, and Chinese companies. And what we're basically looking for is a kind of combination of established brands that have a lot of expertise in cooking and cooking devices, um, making them energy efficient, but also innovative companies that are really going to come in with some entirely new solutions um, that could be from any sector, from the food sector, from the bakery sector. We talked about the challenges of making bread, but it could be from, from other sectors. And because it's a combination, any solution is going to be a combination of energy efficient cooking and the kind of devices that you can cook within, but also that wider energy context, storage, managing energy, helping people to use energy across a mini grid scenario, and then the further context of what novel business models will actually make this a viable option for people um, in the developing world. So it's got to be a mixture of uh, a collaborative approach uh, in, in practice. This thing about uh, business models, Stefan, I mean, you, you know, some of your listeners will be, will be thinking, oh, but can, can they afford, you know, a hundred dollar instant pot? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, actually, if it's, if it's a service arrangement with say a utility, then they can receive the appliance. You know, we used to rent our televisions. That's well, right. if you go back to that, that sort of idea, you can be given the appliance and then just pay it on your bill, you know, $2 a month for the next whatever. Um, and you can't exactly run away. It's a connection to electricity. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it becomes a very natural on bill financing. But then for the more remote locations, if we're talking about solar PV arrangements, um, you know, even that, uh, the lighting industry, the solar lighting industry has found this thing called pay as you go. And basically equipment is given to the family and then they pay regularly through the mobile money to actually uh, uh, keep it enabled. And there is a cut off switch. So if they don't pay, it gets cut off. <laughs> Yeah, um, so. and I think again, a lot of people in 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 the UK aren't really aware that that mobile phone banking is is a really huge deal. The micro banking, um, it, it it's very it's highly functioning, as you say. I mean, again, even in refugee camps, I that, I think that was the thing I was most ex most surprised about was that. Most people in refugee camps have a mobile phone and you kind of think, how does this square up? But you know, these things are actually very low cost and they are essential, you know, especially with fragmented communities to, to keep people in touch. Um, but but um, just back to you, Nick, what, what can you offer these companies? What, 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 what will they get? What's the opportunity for them? Um, well, I think the opportunity ultimately are, are huge markets that we are identifying. The challenge, obviously, is working out well, what product will fit in those markets and how to find a way into those markets and how to make a profit. Um, because 
you know, these companies are, are companies. They're not there just for the, for the goodness of others. Um, so uh, Ed's already referred to the, the grants that we can provide to support innovation and support market research and piloting. We're now moving into that phase where we're funding a number of pilots that will help to build that knowledge base. But we also want, again, I think Ed referred to it, to support the scale up of the really promising solutions. Um, so and that's the kind of the, the, the two sides of what we're offering people. Um, so in India, we're partnering with uh, an Indian government innovation agency to run a collaborative innovation program um, with Tata Trust which runs something called Social Alpha, and they will help companies that would have successful solutions to work out how to manufacture those solutions at scale, how to provide the microfinance that will enable people to get into the markets. Um, and I think what I'm finding, as I say, is that a lot of the companies that are familiar with European or North American markets have trouble understanding how they might engage with uh, a developing country market. So we're looking to um, build a picture of those markets in terms of segments, so there's your, your affluent middle class in Nairobi, in, in Nigeria, wherever. And then you've got people who are slightly less affluent, but have grid connection. Then you have people with mini grids, then you have people with solar home systems. And the more you can set that out, each of those will require a different engagement strategy. Some mm -hmm. of them, you can just put it out into the shops, the retailers, and we're looking at those, looking at what's available already, working with the distributors. Others, you'll have to work with the Kenya Light and Power Company who will then be able to send it out through their networks of their supply customers. Others you work with many good companies. So by identifying the partners in country, we can then help these companies to find their way in um, and to build a solution. Um, the other thing that I think we've not touched on is the, in order to address the affordability challenges, we're also looking to ensure um, we can facilitate bulk purchase so you can get economies of scale if you can get a national organization or an NGO to buy electric pressure cookers at scale and then make them available through, through normal market means. The, the MEX program is invested in something called the Global Leap Award for electric pressure cookers. So this is something that's been done for a range of different types of device to identify energy efficient appliances for the developing world. And we've now done this for electric pressure cookers so that we can establish a robust quality standard against which all devices can be assessed that, that the companies want to have nominated. So that ensures that the buyer is buying a, a product which is going to be safe and that's usable and appropriate for the conditions. And that will create a buyer's guide that will be published in the autumn. And it's that buyer's guide that will people be looking for when they want to pilot EPCs in different contexts or if they want to buy in bulk or they want to make uh, devices available like Kenya Light and Power. So we're creating that kind of market enabling uh, role uh, in, in opening up these opportunities to, to help the affordability challenge. The, the final point I wanted to, to make was coming back to what Simon was saying about the carbon emission savings that you can get from this. That is true also of improved cook stoves, but in order to demonstrate that you have changed the way people cook, you have to go out and visit hundreds of homes to monitor how they cook. If you're using electric devices, you can very simply gather data on the energy use that people are demonstrating in their households. And that means that we can, we're building a framework that will enable uh, it, people who implement uh, clean cooking devices, particularly with electricity, to gain carbon credits. So that will again further subsidize the cost of those devices. And even in some cases, potentially could bring some revenue for the households themselves. We're looking at different models there. Yeah. Okay, well, this is one of the most fascinating um, podcasts I think we've done, but we are running out of time. So, um, Ed, can I come back to you for some final comments? Um, what, what next for the, for the MEX programme? Um, continue to grow, I think, is that, is the, you know, a lot of background research has been done in the first two years of the programme, uh, a lot of landscaping, a lot of, of, of taking our ideas and really beginning to run with them. So I think now is the kind of the, the proof is in the eating, in a, in a sense, uh, thinking about <laughs> it, in that, using that, that, the, the analogy in that way. Um, so proof, proof is in the heating. Area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Heating. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I think there are, you know, so there are a whole uh, drawing on what a lot of people have said. So I think um, we are moving into the beyond the household areas. So I think things like the pre-cooking and the institutional, I think those are areas that are massively important and we really see a massive opportunity for. 
I think also what we were talking about in terms of how, how do we reduce the cost over, overall to um, the, the populations that we're trying to serve. So we've talked about that in terms of uh, bulk buying, we've talked about it in terms of the design of the uh, uh, equipment itself. Um, we're also, and I think Nick just began to touch on it in terms of things like carbon credits, uh, there's also things like uh, um, in, uh, impact bonds. So there's a whole range of different types of activity which we're in investing in. It's also raising uh, more resources to flow into this area. So we're working with social investment funds like Acumen uh, in terms of investing into their portfolio of companies that are looking to embrace this type of technology. So it's that kind of level. It's also embracing uh, getting people to, to getting the international community to see what this can achieve and the connections that there are. If we deal with this issue, then in terms of a dealing with some of the drudgery, the most worst elements of drudgery of women's lives, as, as Anne was saying. So in that sense, if we're able to show that, then if we can increase the amount of international commitment so that the amount of resources going into clean cooking match those going into electrification, you know, that, that kind of thing. So for example, Example, next week we have a uh, we're speaking at a high level meeting uh, a UN high level meeting that's being held virtually we've got a, a, a um uh, a side event at that uh, meeting that's being coordinated by the, the Kenyan government. And so we've got uh, into those kinds of spaces to be able to put this message across. Um, so it's, it's also individual countries um, and developments with those countries. So recently Nepal, for example, made a very big momentous decision, which was to shift from subsidizing gas for cooking to move to subsidizing electricity. So we and various partners of ours, such as the Clean Cooking Alliance, such as the World Bank, such as HIVOS, are working with the Nepal government to work out how that can best be delivered in that sense. Uh, there was also a whole set of, of stories in the media this week in Kenya about the Kenyan government taking the first tentative kind of steps towards promoting cooking with electricity. Uh, they made a bit of a, of, a, of a, maybe not, didn't do it quite as well as they might have done, but there are real opportunities, I think, for us to build on that momentum. So where there is momentum, where we can change the, the, the narrative around these kinds of, of issues. And then I guess finally, it's things like the next round of our challenge fund activity is beginning now to take off. So from a situation where we had uh, in Kenya, people are, are beginning to work on, on, on the national grid, we now have a number of other countries where we begin to work on the national grid. From a situation where we maybe had four or five mini grid companies experimenting, now under this we've got six or seven more that we're working with uh, in, in different contexts. So it's, it's in each of these different areas, it's growing what we're doing, it's getting that message out there and not allowing what we're currently all living through to kind of throw us off course in a sense it's actually if anything it's even more important during this period of the during the, the covid crisis in terms of can we help the international community to build back better in terms of what was there this is a massive challenge for the for the for the globe as um as simon said when we started off the fact that we're living in 2020 and that there are, he says, three billion. Actually, the latest report that's coming out uh, this summer, looking at who has actually got access to modern energy cooking services, it's four billion people. So in that sense, it's being able to, to recognise this is not acceptable. This is not acceptable that we're in this situation. And we know that there are ways in which we can address this if we have the commitment at the political level, if we have the right policies and if we have the investment in order to enable us to to uh, meet the challenges that we've identified through this program. It's really interesting because there, there are, as you say, there are massive challenges, but but the potential for, for solving at least some of the problem, at least, is 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 vast. You know, and, and I'm I'm really impressed by the integrated approach. You know, it's it's not just inventing a cook stove and hoping for the best, but but actually talking to businesses, um, understanding the, the cultural sensitivities of it as well. But I think people just simply don't understand that household air pollution that doesn't just kill people; it, it causes untold misery. You know, respiratory illnesses in in in, in poor communities are is it's just absolutely devastating and. The, the potential to, to improve lives is, is vast here. So it's really exciting. So I, I really look forward to finding out how it unfolds. Now, 
so just to say, as Ed has summed up, um, we, we are very interested. We are very aware that this podcast is going out to the, the food industry and that many of you who are listening might have ideas that have been sparked. They might, you might have insights uh, that would be very helpful to us. So if you do want to get in touch, do please get in touch with Nick through Nick and, and we would welcome that interaction. Okay, well, you've been listening to the Tabletop Podcast brought to you by Food Matters. And this week, in partnership with Loughborough University, you heard from Ed Brown, MEX Research Director, Nick Russo, International Liaison Manager, Simon Batchelor, UK Research and Innovation Coordinator, Arne Tran, International Liaison Manager, and me, Stephen Gates. If you enjoyed this episode, you might like one of our other podcasts in which we explore pretty much every aspect of the food industry, from salmon farm sustainability to gut microbiome analysis. Subscribe to get every episode freshly delivered to you on Apple, Spotify, Google, or your preferred podcasting platform. And also to find out more, take a look at foodmatters.co.uk. Goodbye. So Maureen, what is the Cooking Diary study and what have you learned from it? Uh, okay, thank you. So Cooking Diaries is a study which we have uh, done in Kenya and it's been done in other countries. And I would explain that Cooking Diaries is an intense data collection of uh, what people cook in a household, how it is cooked, and the time taken to cook the meal, and specifically to cook that specific food until, from the start until it's served, and the type of fuel used, and also the quantity or yeah the quantity of the fuel that has been used so this is uh, putting a household into like uh, recording everything that is done in their kitchen uh, that is recording uh, breakfast what they've cooked for breakfast what they've uh, cooked for lunch what they've cooked for dinner and breaking down this, like what they've cooked for dinner, we need like, if it is like three servings, if it's ugali, how long did ugali take to cook? How long did uh, vegetables take to cook? And how long did any other stew that was served take to cook? So we normally give them a cooking diary uh, booklet where they fill all this information. We have uh, research uh, assistants who normally go to their households during the study to just check that they are recording and uh, keeping the flips on so that when we are doing the data entry and analysis, we have the right information we have uh, collected. Uh, the cooking diaries, we normally also give them, uh, we give the households uh, some equipments like the previous one we gave them electric pressure cooker a rice cooker a hot plate and a 3 kg gas cylinder and uh, all these are including a meter reader and all these are plants as was supposed to be used during the cooking dairy studies so within the first uh, two weeks of the study they were free to use any appliances which they would prefer or uh, any fuels which they also had in their houses, including charcoal and uh, kerosene, all, all fuels that are available in their households. And then after two weeks, we now restrict the households to cook with electricity and try as much as possible to use uh, the appliances which we have given them. So, uh, yeah, I would basically say that is uh, cooking diaries. Uh, what I've learned uh, during the cooking diaries, uh, one, I would say behavior change. It is one of the most difficult thing to change in a household or even an individual. So behavior change is the big challenge we have. Uh, uh, about the demonstrations, it has really changed the mindsets of a household and even the community in general. So when we do demonstrations and uh, everyone is uh, looking at the units used to cook a meal, everyone goes like, what is this real? But when they are there and they are looking at it the way the, way the, the food is being cooked and the time it's being, they easily we are easily easily winning their mindset. So 
yeah, everyone is like, uh, where do I get these equipments? Uh, so you can easily see that the mindset is changing. Um, with the cooking diaries, I've learned a lot of uh, cooking tips, which I would say I was so poor uh, in my kitchen. Uh, one of it, and it's very common with any other household, is when we are cooking, we like opening the, the pot, trying to taste the food if it's well cooked and uh, tasting the spices and all that. And during that process, I would say a lot of energy is being lost. So that is one of the tips that I've learned that if I have to cook on an open plate, then I have to use the lid and try as much as possible to retain the lid when, cook, when the food is cooking so that I, I am energy efficient in that process. Um, other cooking tips, I would say, uh, like soaking the heavy foods like uh, beans and maize. If, if you have time, it's better to soak them for some time, even if it's two hours or overnight. The more you soak, the more the food gets tender. And that would mean that when you, when you bring them to cook, it will take the shortest time possible. Um, Procedures. I've learned that it is not all the, uh, the procedures that we've stuck to from what we learned from our parents is what gives us the best meals. I have learned that with uh, some simple procedures like putting all ingredients together and uh, letting the food boil and until the, the, there's less uh, water in the food, it gives like very nice, tasty, delicious food. So that is one of the uh, uh, cooking tips which I've also learned and also the smaller the pieces the quicker the food will cook so if you have your meat and you cut it into smaller pieces the better if you are if you are boiling your sweet potatoes your your yams if uh, you cut them into smaller pieces the faster the food will cook yeah Great, what a comprehensive response to that question. Thank you. Okay. Um, so next question is who are ACTS and what is their role in the MEX program? Okay, so African Center for Technology Studies is an intergovernmental research organization. So uh, it's uh, strengthens the capacity and policies in Africa and African countries and African institutions, sorry. So this is to harness science, technology and innovation for sustainable development. So ACTS will take an active role under the MEX project to pursue like uh, transformations through the multidisciplinary research, evidence and policy as a tool to convening and uh, the various stakeholders and uh, facilitating effects of policies and the new business frameworks and models that are coming uh, in, the new, in the new system. So I would say that uh, renewable energy generation is increasingly getting access to uh, affordable and reliable electricity. So therefore, we have like new opportunities that are coming up in the sector and ACTS will take an active role in maybe creating these new business models, these new business uh, frameworks, and also trying to look at these uh, enabling environment and enabling policies and standardizations in making this uh, sector more uh, eco friendly, I would say making it friendly to either business people, research people and everyone in general. So together with the MEX uh, objectives, ACTS will work uh, as a lead in Africa and uh, try to break the business as usual uh, system which, which we've been uh, in it for ages and uh, try to bring new technologies on board to do the knowledge brokerage in it, uh, more research uh, and uh, policy convening and analysis and also contributing in this uh, policy environment. So basically ACTS leads in the research, uh, policy convening and policy analysis 
uh, technology brokerage and more in capacity building. Great, thank you. Um, and John, feel free if you wanna just come in on any of these questions. So th the next question is, how can we categorize the different types of dishes that Kenyans typically cook? What are the sort of, yeah, the different, the key categories of Kenyan cooking? Okay, so uh, the key categories of um, Kenyan cooking, I would say the first one is the heavy foods, which uh, take maybe three to six hours of boiling or cooking. So this would include, depending on the fuel you are using, this would include like uh, things like beans, matumbo, tri which is tripe, uh, meat, meat stews, which meat stews can be uh, beef, mutton, lambs, and uh, this is like uh, one of the most common uh, foods in Kenya. So the second category is uh, staples. Uh, so staples would be things like ugali. It's, it doesn't take long, but you have to maybe boil a little boiling and then into the mixing of stuff. So uh, ugali, rice, pilau, uh, matoke also falls in that category. Um, yeah, and then the next uh, uh, type of food would say uh, frying. Maybe we need a pan, pan frying. Pan frying we can use to make things like uh, chapati, flatbreads, uh, Yes, and then we also have uh, deep fried foods. So deep fried, we people deep fry chicken. We have mandazi or the donuts. Um, any other things that are deep fried? I don't think I can remember any other thing that can be deep fried. And then we also have uh, other meals that are, that can be quick fried. So quick fried can be vegetables, uh, skumawiki, uh, eggs. Ah, I think I'm confusing that side, John. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, so I think in terms of the order then, the table then, it was flatbreads after. I mean, the order doesn't matter, but when you started talking about the, the frying, I thought you were going to talk about the skumawikis, the way that you were describing it. So for me, the biggest difference, the reason why the flatbreads yeah, there's the quick fries. Mm -hmm. the, the reason why the flatbreads are in a, a different category is because they require very even heat and a medium heat on the pan, whereas quick frying generally it's, yeah. it's higher heat, and you can do it quite easily in a deep pan. And so the reason why we've the main reason why we've differentiated them into two categories is because the chapati is basically impossible to cook on an EPC, whereas um, things like skuma wiki, then you can cook on an EPC, especially if people give you a demonstration when you first get the appliance. So categorizing uh, different foods in Kenya, I would say we have uh, heavy foods, which would take long to boil. You need like uh, three to four, five hours to boil the food first. So these are things like beans, matumbo, giveri, meat stew and stuff and the other one is the staples which would uh would need like short shorter boiling maybe 30 minutes to one hour uh, and this would uh include things like uh, rice pilau matoke uh, and um, mokimo or mashed mashed potatoes and maize pre-boiled maize and then we have the quick fries, which include uh, things like vegetables. We don't need really boiling. We just have to put in your ingredients and the oil and then uh, put the food in within five minutes or, or 10, it's well cooked. And then we also have the deep fried foods, which you need to really have uh, high temperatures to heat the oil. And these include things like uh, mandazi or donut. Uh, deep fried chicken and uh, maybe pork also people also deep fry pork and then we also have the flat breads 
So these are things like chapati and you really need a pot that you, you need it open, wide open and um, energy on the surface is actually almost evenly uh, distributed in the, in the pot. And these are things like chapati, which uh, every household would say is more of a weekly meal. So, and then uh, we also have things that maybe would need baking or an oven, so, uh, but not really common in Kenya. That was perfect, thank you. Can I ask how important are each of these different categories of food? You say baking is not really important, but it's more of an occasional thing. What about the other foods? How often do people cook heavy foods or how often do they make chapati, for example? Um, I would say heavy foods are, uh, every household would have a heavy food in a day. So heavy foods uh, are more of the main things that people cook in Kenya. So everyone would uh, maybe serve uh, they are chapati with beans or chapati with uh, any other cereals, green grams, lentils, which really need like heavy cooking or uh, foods that would take longer to cook. So um, I would say heavy foods are main, mainly in every household in Kenya and happens like on a daily basis. Um, staples are also, uh, staples are, everyday thing but uh it is easy and quick to to cook hmm? what about the other ones how often do you deep fry for example oh i i explain all of it uh yeah i just go down and say you like you said for baking we don't bake very often or deep frying um, maybe you, you might say we eat lots of deep fried things, but mostly we buy them as, as street food rather than prepare them at home. Whatever you think is a, a good way of describing how often, how important these different categories are on the Kenyan menu. Oh, okay. So I would say staples is also an everyday and every meal uh, prepared in every household. So it is quite um, an a day in day day activity in no let me just start <laughs> yeah if, if you find that you stumble on anything or, or you think of a better way of saying it just go for it again because we'll just edit out like all of this that we're recording now we're going to edit yeah. it down into just a few minutes so just say it cleanly afterwards and we'll cut that bit okay so staples are very important in every household. I would say every household would have a, a, a meal that is uh, shortly boiled and uh, later maybe you do the stew of it or you do the stew and leave it to simmer for some time. So this is a, a procedure that every household in every meal would have to do. Uh, for the quick fry food, Things like uh, skumawiki, it's also an everyday or every meal activity. And then in Kenya, for the, the deep frying, um, it is not an everyday thing in, in an household. I would say maybe things like mandazi, people can easily buy them from uh, 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 someone who has a vendor who's, who's doing this as a business from maybe a shop outside their estate or a shop uh, within their reach. And this is uh, a norm in our communities. So, so for the flatbreads, we really need like a pan and more open and the heat should be uh, very evenly distributed. And uh, uh, these kind of meals are not an everyday thing in Kenyan household. And I'd say maybe a house would prepare chapati for maybe a whole bag of it and refrigerate what remains after they've eaten the meal and take it for two, three other days. So it is not an everyday thing and some households would actually pre uh, prefer going to buy from 
maybe a vendor outside their their estate or uh, on the streets. Yeah. Cool. Um, so we know that EPCs can't cook all foods. Can you talk us through how compatible uh, these types of foods are with an EPC? Okay, I would say an EPC is compatible to varieties of foods in Kenya. And I would say majority of of uh, the foods that we serve on our tables are uh, actually can be cooked on a uh, electric pressure cooker. It's only maybe the pan frying or the deep frying that would really need like another option of, uh, of uh, fuel. But uh, with an EPC, I would say almost 90% of our foods can be cooked in an electric pressure cooker. As you've had, most of our foods are long boiled or shortly boiled and uh, do the stew part of it. And this can be easily done on an electric pressure cooker or even a rice cooker. Yeah. Okay. Great. And um, can I just ask right. you a follow up one to that one? Yeah. Um, are, are there any challenges with cooking any of the other foods on, on an EPC? For example, ugali. We know that people can cook ugali on the EPC, but for some people it's it, it's not instinctual. So maybe if you could just talk us through the other categories and, and any challenges that you think may may arise with, with each of those. Okay. So the challenges uh, on using electric pressure cooker on a few of our main dishes, probably like ugali, it is possible to cook ugali in an EPC, but then, uh, the paste itself doesn't come out as uh, people are used to. So like uh, when you're cooking ugali in an EPC, it doesn't harden or get to the harder paste which you would get in uh, an open uh, pot. So, and sometimes stirring uh, the ugali, you really need to stir it a lot. And using an EPC, when you're stirring, if you don't have the right, um, equipment to hold on the pot, it keeps rotating and it is it is it it becomes disadvantaged in getting to what we are really used to. And also the taste because it doesn't he really heat up very well. So the taste is a bit different, but it is uh, uh it it is served as ugali but with slightly different taste. Great. And um, how much electricity do Kenyan households generally use to, to cook? Uh, it depends on how, how regular you use uh, the electricity. And also it depends on uh, the appliances which you've used. So if you use a hot plate, you would definitely use more units to cook a meal because there is a lot of heat loss uh, around it. But if you use like the right uh, energy efficient appliances, then that it makes sense as uh, all the energy is centralized and the incubation of the energy also uh, helps the food cooks quickly and hence it becomes an energy efficient appliances. So you wouldn't use uh, more units when you're using an energy efficient appliance. Uh, I would say on an estimate in my house, I would uh, um, pay maybe seven, 700 shillings for an extra for having cooked with electricity in a month. And that is like every other meal, using electricity on every, every, every other meal. So would you say that you cook half of your food with electricity or you use it for just maybe one dish in every other meal? What, what, so people get an idea of what proportion and how much do you spend on the other fuel, which I assume is gas. Is that right? Yeah. So if you could tell us what's your monthly cooking cost, so or how often you fill up your gas cylinder, how much it costs and 
how much of your cooking roughly you do on each? Is it 50-50, is it 60-40, that kind of thing? Okay, so in my house, I use electricity to cook most of the stews, like uh, beef, chicken, pork, fish. Um, and on average, I have uh, spent like 700 shillings extra on my monthly uh, electricity bill because of cooking with electricity. And the other option I have is the uh, LPG, which we refill the 13 kg cylinder with uh, 2,100 shillings. And that would take me for a month and two weeks. And does the gas cylinder last longer now that you're able to cook some of the food with electricity? Sorry? Does the gas cylinder last longer now that you're able to cook some of the food with electricity? Yes, the, the, of course, using uh, uh, electricity to cook on these, uh, the, on, of course, using electricity to cook most of my stews, it saves me the, from using the gas. So gas, I would say I use it to, to cook meals like uh, chapati, uh, frying eggs in the morning, or um, uh, making my husband's ugali. But then uh, when, we, when my husband maybe has traveled and uh, is, uh, is not in for the meal, then I can easily use my rice cooker to even prepare my ugali. And we can easily cook using uh, electricity purely when my husband is not around. If you could just introduce yourself, what is your name and, and what is it that you do? My name is Wairimu Kitehia and I work for Kenya Power Company that is in Kenya and I run the Pekana Power Cookery Program on Tuesdays and Thursdays at the centre in the electricity house. Okay, great, thank you. And um, what's on the menu in Kenya? The menu for today, we're gonna to take you on our culinary journey through Kenya. We'll take you to the coast region where we will have favorite of Mahamri and Baazi. Mahamri is like a triangle donut, which mm. is uh, very rich with coconut. And then we also have the Baazi, which is also cooked in coconut. This is a favorite breakfast meal for the coast people. Then we'll go to Kisumu Western, where we'll cook uh, some dried fulu. Dried fulu is um, large sardines, not the very small ones, which we call omena. They're the large sardines. And uh, we'll also do an all time favorite of Kenya, chapati. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And when- they Dave, make yeah, sure don't... you mute your mic when you when you've asked the question because you went mmm halfway through that one. Sorry, it sounds so tasty. <laughs> it did make it sound delicious. That was also not the response I was expecting for that. I was thinking about Kenya in general on an everyday basis, but that's actually a much better response. It was a much nicer Thank answer. You. Yeah, I love yeah, that. It response. was, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Warren. No, um, I was relating it to um, the clean cooking. Remember, those are the dishes yeah, we cooked. No. And that's really good that you did, that you can even remember all of the dishes after this much time. So that will make a fantastic introduction to the video. So thank you. And so when, when people are cooking those dishes, um, what kind of fuels do people use in Kenya to cook those dishes? Generally, the fuels that are used in Kenya are wool, uh, charcoal, firewood, probably even gas, not so much electricity, that is what we are trying to change. But in the coast region, for the Mbazi and the uh, Mahamri, they'll probably be using firewood because it's something that they make at the side of the road. You know, these little shops, these little eating areas. So they're usually just made in the open air. So it's firewood probably or charcoal. Uh, with the fulu, same thing, they're done by the seaside, or yeah, by the seaside, lakeside, should I say. 
outside there, they dry them and fry them and sell them to to the people who are coming to the lakeside to just enjoy an afternoon or or you know their day out. The chapati regularly would cook it with a charcoal or electric uh, hot plate because it will give more even cooking. Super. And I know that you are a fan of cooking with electricity. Um, how long have you been cooking with electricity? How long have I been cooking with electricity? I personally have been cooking with electricity for a long time because I have worked in this job for a long time on and off. Uh, this uh, job of cooking for Kenya Power started off in 1970s, so I wasn't there then. But I joined the company in the early 90s and we were cooking with electricity. We were doing exactly what we're doing now. It's only that it was stopped at some time. So I've been cooking with electricity for a long time. And what do you feel are the, the benefits of cooking those dishes that you spoke about earlier and generally cooking with electricity are? Uh, the benefits of cooking those dishes that I mentioned with electricity are, for one, it will, it's clean cooking. There's no smoke around you because, you know, you're cooking in the open air, like they will do it in the open air. So there's a lot of smoke and obviously uh, it's uh, the taste of the food would be different because now there's an additional taste of the firewood or the charcoal. So if you're cooking with electricity, one, it will be very fast. It will be clean. And nobody needs to know what you're cooking. But when you're cooking that open air with the charcoal and the firewood, you know, the whole neighborhood knows, hey, Wairimu is cooking some fish. Let's go visit her. So it seems that uh, those are plenty good reasons to be cooking with electricity um, that you've just mentioned. What do you feel people's reservations are in Kenya and, and in a wider sense what are their reservations about cooking with electricity? Uh, the reservations on cooking with electricity in Kenya, one is the investment uh, of the appliance because the appliances don't come cheap. So it is cheaper to probably buy just a Jiko, for example, or an LPG stove. It's cheaper than the investment that you make to buy electrical appliances. So that is one thing that people are like, ah, it's too expensive to buy an electrical appliance. Another thing is that people have this misconception that electricity is expensive. So that is what I am trying to change through my cookery show program, because anytime I cook, I use an energy meter. So at the end of the show, we look at the energy meter and everybody's like, what? You mean we cooked githeri? I don't know, Jay, if you know what githeri is. We cooked maize and beans, a favorite of Kenya. Uh, maize and beans with only eight shillings. And yet, when I use uh, charcoal, I'll probably use a 2 kg, which we call a gorogoro, uh, which costs 100 shillings. So they're like, what? You mean we've been doing it wrong all this time? So that is what I'm trying to change one step at a time. And it's working. People are switching to cooking with electricity. They come to my classes a couple of times and everybody's buying some electrical appliance from me and they're buying an energy meter. And they're like, you know what? It actually makes sense to cook with electricity. So we are getting there slow, but sure. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And so you're on that journey of, of getting people to, to realize the benefits of cooking <clears throat> with electricity and the sort of the obvious money savings that you just mentioned there. What are you, what is your opinion on the best ways to spread that message um, across a country like Kenya? Um, what do you think are the sort of key factors that, that need to happen to, to spread that message? The key factors to spreading that message in Kenya would be uh, to open up probably more cooking centers like I have in Nairobi, because we have Kenya Power offices all over the country. So we could have a center in each region where people can come. By the way, the classes are free. They are free of charge. 
so it would encourage people to come and uh, people want to see it happening you know they don't want to hear about it so it would be great if i could get a mobile kitchen where i could go right out into the villages even where there's power and they only think power is for a light source they don't imagine that they can cook with it i remember when we went with the, the shamba shaper uh visit to kibwezi the lady who was there had all these electrical appliances in our home which she didn't use and she was like electricity is expensive so when we went out with to the with the epc and she was like what i cook this nice dish it's so tasty because it retains all the nutrition all the nutrients are retained we don't have to throw out any water or anything so the nutrients are retained she's able to go and do other activities while her food is cooking the husband was like why haven't we never known about this before and then they go and unveil a washing machine they told me they've had that washing machine for two years but they think it's too expensive to use that appliance so i was like no so i demonstrated how to use it and they were like what we've just been sitting here so there is that thing of people are just afraid of what they don't know they just know electricity is expensive but nobody has actually sat down to think about it or to explain to them so that is the job that i have the uphill task of trying to reach as many people as i can and actually demonstrate virtually you know we actually cook with them so it's not something i'm giving them a book to read and they're like are you sure so i want to cook with them like we do in the cookery classes i cook with them and we see the end they taste the food because they're like no 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 earth and pots the food tastes better oh the one cooked with fire would taste better so we do those experiments with them and they see yes the food actually tastes better especially in the electric pressure cooker amazing um yeah what a great response <laughs> um so you spoke briefly about the pika and power program what what exactly is the pika and power program the pika and power program is an initiative by kenya power to be able to reach out to our customers out there who already have electricity or are hoping to get electricity and we show them how to use electrical appliances efficiently we 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 get them to see different appliances even to be used around the shamba domestic appliances you know it could be a chaff cutter it could be what so we i deal with domestic appliances not commercial so we want you have power in your house you have a socket you can use power and you can make your life cleaner you know you don't have to go out into the smoke where and then you don't even have to watch your food cooking especially like if you have the epc you can leave your food cooking and you go tend to your animals you know so we are trying to empower these women at home uh to use the electricity and so that they are healthier and their households are also healthier because if firewood is being you're cooking with firewood the whole place is smoky your children come in they go out they have all these uh, coughing and more respiratory diseases so it may not be evident then but after a long time of cooking i remember my own grandmother used to cook with firewood you'd go in there and you'd be like where are you show show where are you you know you can't even see her in that but she's like she's comfortable cooking in there so those are the people who want to get to and if we are able to reach them it will be good for them also for kenya power it is good yes we are introducing clean cooking but also it's a benefit to us they will also use another unit of power maybe two three units which translated to our seven million customers it would be a good uh, sales growth for us but primary objective is to introduce people to energy efficient appliances so i have all these energy efficient appliances at my place i have infrared cookers i have the induction cookers and then i also have even um, energy bulbs instant showers all those domestic appliances which are energy efficient so that people can spend their money wisely i don't want people to say they're getting broke because of using electricity no use electricity it is cheaper than using any other type of fuel I hope I've answered your question. 
not only have you answered the question, you've also answered the next question, which is quite incredible, because the next question was going to be, what electric cooking appliances is Kenya Power promoting, which you just started already talking about. Um, I think it's worth asking that one in a, in a bit more detail, though. Yeah, just, uh, well, to break them down one by one and say, what is the appliance? What does it do well? What are its limitations? Okay, some of the appliances that we are promoting right now are basically three cooking appliances. We have the induction cooker, which compared to any other stove is very fast. And one of the things I love about it is that it's very safe even to touch when it's cooking because it only heats where there is contact. So all the other surfaces around it, around the pot, you can touch. Uh, it has a lock method, so a lock program, so that even if you're cooking and you go away and you've locked it, nobody can tamper with your temperatures that you've put in and all that. It has different menus selection that you can have, which are already pre-programmed. For example, if you're cooking rice, it will start off on high heat and it will actually uh, gradually reduce until it goes off. So you can also leave it unattended. The best, the all-time best is the milk menu. If you put in milk in that pot, it doesn't overflow. It just gets to the top and comes down. So you'll never have more tea pouring. Then of course, it's highly portable. You can put it back in your backpack and go home with it. And it's not that much, you know, it's not such a heavy investment. The only downside about it is that it uses a, which people think is a downside, but it's actually a healthy downside because you can only use stainless steel pots with it or cast iron, which of course is healthier than aluminum. So I also tell people about that. So all in all, it is a better option than these other stoves which are using any other pot. Um, then we have the infrared. The infrared is good as well. It goes up to 2000 watts, it heats up well. And because of the way it is, it gives very even cooking. So if you are cooking John's favorite, the chapati, it will give you better uh, color. You know, the dots will all be brown all over, not in a specific place. If you're cooking pancakes, you also get very nice uh, uh, browning all over. Uh, the downside about it is that it is hot even when it is or when there's no pot on it. With the induction cooker, once you remove the pot, it goes off immediately, so it's safe. But this one, if you remove the pot, it's still hot. So that safety aspect there is something that needs to be watched. You can't leave it unattended, especially if you have children in the house. Um, it's also very portable. So that is also a plus. And um, you can use any type of pot on it. You can use the aluminum pot, you can use the stainless steel, can use the cast iron. So for people who are not ready to change automatically, I see them preferring to go with the infrared. But the people who understand the health benefits of using stainless steel pots, they go with the whole, you know, they buy the induction cooker and they're looking for stainless steel pots immediately. So that's that. Then we have the EPC, which of course is the all time favorite. It is, um, that's the electric pressure cooker, which of course, it's very fast because it's so well insulated. It's so safe. I've actually tried to open it a couple of times when it's cooking and it won't open. And you know, I'm, I'm opening it like, are you sure it's not going to pop out? But it doesn't. And uh, I love it because it's all one pot. You can fry, start with the frying and then, you know, boil and whatever. So it's just one stop, you know. So you only have one pot to wash. Uh -huh. I only have one pot to wash, not several to wash. And the aspect of um, delay cooking, that you can actually decide, start cooking at 1 p.m. and let my food be ready, slow cook for until 4 p.m. So that's a great feature on that. And, um, and of course it retains all the nutrients because there's nothing that's going out. You don't have to use a lot of water. So you just use minimum water, so everything is retained. For me, I think that really improves the flavor of the food. And if you cook something like um, matumbo, matumbo is tripe, which is a favorite in uh, Kenya. You don't even need to add any water. If you just put in your 
tomatoes and onions and whatever else you're putting in and you cook it, it has just enough sauce. Whereas traditionally, with the matumbo, you cook it for like an hour before you can fry it, you know, because it's so hard. You know, you usually have to cook it for a long time and you keep on adding water, adding water. So definitely the taste is not the same. So the EPC is, is a winner. It's a winner. So those are what we are promoting right now. And we are able to move quite a few pieces every month, about 20 pieces every month through just our little outlet. So I think it's doing good. Fantastic. Um, so a follow-up follow question that's going off the script now, but you say you're managing to sell 20 units per month from your, from your outlet. What would it take for you to go to the next uh, scale if you wanted to start selling, say, 200 or 2,000 or even 20,000 units every, every week? What would we need to get there? For us to improve on sales, but for one, Kenya Power is not a business of selling uh, any appliances. We just partner with uh, the supplier. So we are finding that even the suppliers who supply, because of our program and the Shamba Shape Up, thanks to you, Meg, is really moving that product out there. It's only that we don't know how many not maybe through me, not through Jikoni Magic, or who just people who have watched um, Shamba Shape Up and walk into the shop, the sales have gone up. I've tried to ask in a few supermarkets and uh, the zone was telling me suddenly there's so much interest in this EPC. And I'm putting it down to that Shamba Shape Up. Like today, somebody came to my office to buy one and I asked them, how did you know about it? They said, oh, through Shamba Shape Up, you see? So probably the sales are really going up, but because we are just an office and they know Kenya Power is not in a business of selling appliances, probably that's why they're not coming directly to us. But if we were having an outlet, I'm sure we would move even two, three hundred a month. Um, so my, my final question then is, because there may be appliance manufacturers and other international people watching this, and they may think, well, why should we try and sell electrical appliances in Kenya? Um, aren't all African countries having a shortage of power? Why is it important for Kenya Power to sell more power? Well, okay. Why is it important for Kenya Power to sell more power? Because we want revenue. I, the, my peak and a power uh, is in the section called sales growth. So we want to make sales. Yeah, we're in a business. And is there enough electricity to sell? Where is the limit? I think, okay, I don't know. Maybe Martha would be able to answer that question a bit better. But I think we have enough electricity. We have more electricity that's being generated than what is being taken up. So we need to uh, improve our take up so that we can put Kenya Power in a better place. 